Bronco Nation to another exciting video. You may notice one or two things different about this video. Uh, first off, I got Jake from Master Football to my left. Um, and then what was it? There was one more thing. Oh, right, the new space. So uh, welcome to my new studio space. No, I'm just kidding. This is not my permanent stuff. Uh, I am here at the Boise State eSports facility. There is another video that I'm so excited for that is going to be coming out, touring the facility, interviewing players, interviewing coaches. It's going to be an incredible video. I can't wait for that. But we have another exciting video, one I am equally excited for because it's always awesome when I get to be able to talk with Jake right here. And uh, this is a video that's actually been going on both of our channels. So as always, make sure you check out the Master Football, Jake Posey, incredible stuff. It's going to be a little bit of a different video. We're both going to be asking each other questions. We're going to be talking range from Boise State football to Pac-12 realignment. So and everything in between, thanks so much for everybody for being here. And Jake, I'll let you take it away. Well, Jake, I appreciate it. Obviously, a fantastic name and fantastic studio. First of all, we both walked in here and we were like, oh, yeah, absolutely. We're like, this is awesome. <laughs> okay, so my first question, here you go. We, what we wanted to do, the idea behind this, was so we could set up some sort of the, the pack two, added four, we're gonna have a six pack. Since then, there's six pack of questions, three for me, three for him. Since then, <laughs> there's been some movement, is what we'll say on that front. We will get to that in a second here. But I'm gonna make sure that my questions based towards him are gonna be more towards his channel, making sure that we're talking about Boise State-centric topics. His, towards myself, are gonna be a little bit more co towards college football overall in addition to some things about EA college football. So we're gonna get into that right now. My first question is for you, Jake. And I'm not being unprofessional. This is where my notes are at. I wanted to keep it small, <laughs> sleek, okay? All right, Qu first question. You've got this question beforehand. You've had some time to think about this. Mm. Where does Boise State stand as a program in college football overall? CFP, realignment, the future of college football. What's going on with Boise State? Well, it's a very interesting multi-phase question, of course, looking at Boise State because Pac-12 realignment, which is something we're going to talk about right now, I think has changed the future here for Boise State a little bit, changed where they are at. Now, has it changed as dramatically as we thought that it was going to? Maybe not. But I do think that Boise State's in a different place right now from where they started. Uh, Boise State's path to the playoffs, and we're talking about where they're going to be in two years for the Pac-12, because obviously their time in the Mountain West is coming to a close here. So looking at Boise State going forward, where does Boise State set up being in the Pac-12? And as everybody knows, I've had my own questions about that. But I do think that it's a positive step. Uh, first off, I do think the path in the Pac-12 is going to be clearer. You're playing with just the top teams in the Mountain West, plus gu guaranteed Oregon State and Washington State every year. Obviously, playing them this year, that's not the norm. We had a scheduling agreement, which ended up becoming a conference posting agreement. But uh, we had a scheduling agreement uh, that allowed us to play those teams. But now we're going to have two teams with power five roots on the schedule every year, which will elevate our program. And I think that the Pac-12 has higher name recognition. We'll have some, obviously, the polls, it's all biased now. There's no computer BCS elements added in. So it's all how do people think about you. And with that Pac-12 name attached, that 11 and 1, 12 and 0 record now looks a little bit more impressive. So I do think that they are on a clearer path. However, it is not as clear a path overall as we thought that it could be with the new Pac 12 because, one, the American Athletic Conference. For now, we'll see what happens in a week, two weeks, or a month. I mean, everything can change. But for now, American Athletic Conference is still out there kicking strong. And so Boise State's going to continue to have the same issues that they've had while being a Mountain West team, where they're having to compete against those American Athletic Conference teams with similar or better records. Who, Which team is evaluated as better? And it, honestly, in the past, if you've had two teams at 11-2, and two, the East Coast team gets the higher nod in the polls. And so Boise State, again, str stronger strength of schedule, better name recognition. But is it enough to counter that East Coast bias with a conference like the American Athletic Conference still out there strong? I don't know. And so I think that the path to the CFP is clearer, but not solidified. We still need things outside of Boise State to happen that will give us our step forward. We don't necessarily control our own destiny every single year. Now, where does Boise State stand in realignment? Well, obviously, Pac-12, I'm not going to go super in-depth on that because you're going to go more in-depth on that phase. Also, I've had, you know, we've, I've had a couple of videos already talking about this as well. But where does Boise State set itself up for realignment in general right now? Because what we're saying right now is that the dominoes have not stopped falling. I don't think conference realignment is going to be maybe ever done. I mean, it's going to continue to, con Never whatever, you know, everything that kicked off with the Big East and even before that is just continued to spiral and it's going to continue to be a factor for probably the rest of the eternity of college football. So where does Boise State stand right now as a 
as a playoff, ex not a playoff, sorry, as a conference expansion candidate. Because obviously, there's been several rounds of expansion and they've been passed up every time so far. Mm -hmm. I think right now, as far as being an expansion candidate for like maybe the ACC or the Big 12, depending on what happens in their future, Boise State is setting itself up in a better place. I think obviously, again, being part of that Pac-12, even though again, it's, it's still not a, it's not a power four. It's not gonna be, I don't think it's gonna get its autonomous status back. I think it's still gonna be considered somewhat of a group of six. That does raise your name elevation, uh, right? And obviously college, college football in general, so much of that is about doing what others have done. Nobody would really likes to be trailblazers in the world of college football. And Boise State does, the blue turf and everything else like that, obviously. But most teams, most conferences, they don't like to be trailblazers. So if Boise State's already been considered as an expansion candidate and has been elevated, maybe other conferences would consider that as well. But I think that you've got one, two other big elements here that I think are gonna raise Boise State status. One, the Heisman campaign with Ashton Genty. I think that's gonna have huge ripple effects. If that's something that can actually move to fruition, if we can see him in New York, either standing and taking the trophy or being part of the contention for that trophy, that being a group of five program that is a Heisman contender, mm -hmm. that, that shows that you're not just an average team. I mean. We've had great athletes in the group of five in the past, but I don't think anyone's run the group of five since BYU did it, and they weren't even really a group of five type program back yeah. then. It was a little bit of a different circumstances than what we are today. Um, so having that Heisman contention, I think, whether he wins it or not, has elevated Boise State status. And then it's gonna be that CFP. Can Boise State get to the playoffs? Can they be a team that is routinely competing for and being in that? Because unfortunately for Boise State, the last round of realignment happened to coincide with, let's just say not some great years for Boise State mm -hmm. in their history at least. And so when we're talking about realignment, a lot of it's what have you done lately and what Boise State is managing to do with its Heisman campaign and with its CFP potential pushes here and being in that top 25 again, right? Being on that national stage can help you compete against your regional market that has always held Boise State back if you're able to be a national team. And that's another thing is that Boise State, a lot of people are starting to, re what I've been banging the drum for years now about the TV markets, the regional TV markets just not being that much of a factor, more and more and more people are saying the same thing. And this latest round of Pac-12 realignment, they haven't been going hot and heavy after the USS. I mean, I, I know they were part of that package, but they weren't necessarily the front runners. They haven't been going hot and heavy after, you know, UConn. They weren't trying to pay UNLV's entire package out of the Mountain West. You know, they mm -hmm. weren't saying we're going to pay all 17 million for you, and that was a factor in their decision. So, you know, the the decision makers at B, and I don't know if it's just new people stepping up or if it's maybe the old heads finally actually seeing the truth, but people are starting to realize that. Yeah, having a large regional TV market, if you're a successful team, is a plus. But if you don't have all the other building blocks, however many people happen to live in your zip code really doesn't matter. And so I think that has set Boise State up uh, up well. And then it's kind of the final part of this question, and then I'll hand it back to Jay because I talk forever. Um, but the final part of this question here, kind of future of college football, where does Boise State sit in that? I mean, that's really hard to say. We'll have to see where things go. I think Pac-12 does provide Boise State a better opportunity to avoid being relegated if that next phase of P2 split does happen because mm -hmm. now you've already kind of essentially concentrated most of the top teams in this one conference. And they're gonna have, again, that higher name recognition, higher brand awareness. And so hopefully that can help Boise State have a leg up in being maybe a out, not, not quite outside looking in, but maybe in the next phase you have a, and again, we're theorizing what this may look like going forward, yeah. but you, maybe you have something like Big Ten, SEC, and then kind of a best of the rest kind of situation, like a three-way path, and maybe Boise mm -hmm. State could be part of that. Um, but whatever that ends up being, whatever Boise State does right now is gonna impact what it can do going forward. And so Boise State's future, as far as a college football, uh, as, as one of the top tier elements of college football are all gonna depend on if what we're seeing with Spencer Danielson can continue to build, have that CFP success, have that Heisman success, continue to build the program now, and that will set the future. Absolutely. No, and you had mentioned too with that, with the fact that, because you and I have gone over the fact of like, oh, you gotta add rice, because it gives you the Houston market. And we're like, <laughs> dude, it doesn't. It's something more and more happening, and, and they've been talking about this more and more with the fact that the Pac-12, the new Pac-12 right now, is going to explore certain DTC options, DTC options, direct, to consumer, no going through ESPN, no going through somebody else, and all that matters in that instance is are people watching you or are people not watching you? Nobody cares how many households can be bundled into the cable package, the cable, by the way, that everybody is dropping and cutting the cord on. <laughs> so lots of things are happening. At the end of the day, like you said, and this will be lead into some of the things I'll say, are people watching you, yes or no? Boise State leans more towards yes. 
And well, my question for you is uh, going to lean into that Pac-12 discussion as well. I'm actually, I know that this is going a little bit out of order. I'm going to save my first question uh, for last for you. So we're sure. going on to question two. Sure. Um, but just talking about that Pac-12 realignment, I know that I kind of talked a little bit about it, but this is something you love to talk about on yeah. your channel. You do a really, really good job. I, again, whether, I don't know if you're watching this video on my channel, if you're watching it on Jake's. If you're watching it on Jake's, make sure you like, subscribe. If you're watching it on mine, hey, take a break. Go like and subscribe. Watch it on his. This is, he does a gr incredible job breaking down that conference realignment element. Um, and I really enjoy this video. So with that thought in mind, Pac-12, and I've got a little bit of a multi-part question for you as well, but we'll kind of go piece by piece. Just right off the bat for the Pac-12, what are your thoughts on these alignment moves? I mean, I know there's been a lot of questions about whether this was done properly or not, but just kind of your overall take on what this realignment is, has it been done well and what your overall thoughts are. Absolutely. So this is going to feed into kind of the the thing I just mentioned there before, direct to consumer. The reason why we're here, and if you look back at this, there was a couple different conference realignments. There was Arkansas leaving from the, the Southwest Conference to go to the uh, SEC Conference. Part of that was because, what was I think it was like five out of the eight members of the Southwest Conference were under investigation. <laughs> we're not gonna go into that. We're not gonna go there. So that, there was other reasons behind that. And then you saw a couple years later, it was Nebraska. Nebraska decided to go over from the Big 12 to the Big 10, and then Colorado went from the Big 12 to the uh, to the Pac-12. Missouri went from the Big 12 to the SEC. Most of that was because of frustrations with the Longhorn Network. And actually, the Longhorn Network is the reason why Oklahoma and Texas are not in the Pac-12 right now. Mm. Again, this has been happening forever. So people acting like, I just wanted to calm down. Too bad this is conference realignment. Where are we at today? Why are we having these conversations? Let's make sure, because I've seen online, that you've seen a lot of different people blaming, oh, it's this, oh, it's that, da, 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 da. There's <laughs> two people and two groups, I'll say, to blame in this whole situation, Fox and ESPN. Let's make sure that we're absolutely clear as to what's going on and the reason why we are where we are. It's because Texas and Oklahoma, ESPN from the SEC, they wanted them over, and then the Big Ten was like, who are we gonna take? Screw, screw uh, geography, U USC and uh, UCLA. <laughs> And then the, the ball kind of falls down from there. Then the Big 12 takes from the American, the American takes from Conference USA, Conference USA takes from the Colonial, and you just do this, this happens every single time. Right now that ball of responsibility is in the Pac-12's court. And like, you can't take from the Mountain West, and it's like, the Mountain West is gonna take from the- uh, the, the Mac the, or the, something. The, the, uh, that, we will talk about that, that is ridiculous. <laughs> we will talk, that is ridiculous. The, the Mountain West is gonna take from Conference USA. Conference USA is gonna take from the, uh, well, the Big Sky Conference. The Big Sky Conference is gonna take from the Frontier Conference. It's just gonna, crap runs downhill. This happens every single time. So, your point is to be, what is happening right now with the Pac-12 and the realignment? So. As most people probably know, the Pac-12 added four members from the, uh, the Mountain West, four of the three of the top members of the Mountain West, <laughs> yeah. and then one that we'll talk about who's really trying really hard. We're gonna, we're gonna mention we talk about they're trying really, really hard, okay? Then they turn their eyes to the East. They were looking to add an Eastern group of teams to make sure you have kind of like a central and mountain different time zone aspect to it. They looked over, they looked at South Florida, it was uh, Memphis, it was Tulane, and then it was UT San Antonio. Making sure that you had kind of like all four time zones. You can have play games at noon Eastern. You can play games at 1030 Eastern. You can have the full gamut of games. They said no. Then they turned back and they looked to the, uh, the Mountain West again. They're like, hey, round two, Gloria Navarez, bless her heart, is very aggressive. She is certainly not going to uh, lay down without a fight. This is the craziest thing ever. The Mountain West, of those remaining eight teams that were there, Seven of them agreed to sign an agreement to stay in the, the Mountain West. And one of them, Utah State, apparently they waited until they heard UNLV did, realized they were out, signed with the Pac-12. So drama there already between dissension among the group members. Right now there's, there's lawsuits going on, there's exit payments, are they gonna get the money, are they not? Mount, uh, you know, Air Force and UNLV, they get giant chunks of uh, money, whereas you know, Hawaii and New Mexico don't. There's just so many things to go through. Let's make sure that we're clear about something here. The Pac-12, in the same way that the Big 12 taking from the American, the same way that the SEC taking from the Big 12, in the same way that you know, uh, James Madison was pushed, pushed up to the Sun Belt from the uh, FCS ranks, 
The Pac-12 is doing what they can to survive. Let's make sure that we're clear about that because a lot of people are like, oh, they need to just sacrifice for themselves for the good of college football. But everybody else can just do whatever the hell they want to get as much money as they can. Pac-12 is doing their thing. At this time, the best move they had was take from those top teams. Here's a stat that I had. This is wild. The people are like, oh, the Mountain West and the Pac-12, basically the same thing. Let's address that ridiculous statement. Okay, so let's just take, make sure that we are clear now. Of the, how do I say this? One of your questions, is this hands down the best G6 league? Or is this just Mountain West 2.0? Let's make sure that we're clear. The Mountain West in its history has had 11 conference championship games, 11 conference championship games. That's 22 different appearances out there. Of the four and now five members that have been added in, that accounts for 17 of the 22 appearances in the Mountain West championship game. Most of them, I think. That's basically all. That, that Colorado State, we know you're trying, okay? <laughs> we know you're trying, okay? That Colorado, you and I have been on Colorado State. We're like, yo, dude, you guys are, they're like the person who it like counts their calories, does their steps, goes to bed on time, does everything they can, and they can't lose a pound of weight. Colorado State, keep at it. It will turn around. We don't know when. You don't know when. But keep going. But let's Norvell just make sure. Know when. They don't know what's up. <laughs> let's make sure we're clear about this too. Okay, so that's just five members. Okay, but what about that? There's other uh, people that have been shown in their conference championship game. Washington State, Oregon State. Washington State, as late, or excuse me, as soon as 2018, was number seven in the AP poll. So let's make sure we're, the, we're clear. Like this, oh, they're just not capable of being a good team. Let's just, okay. Well, the AP said uh, they're the number seven team in the country. Did they end up as the number 17? No, I think they ended up 19, something like that. Last year, we all forget right now, we're looking at Oregon State. Oh, they lost to Oregon. Last year, Oregon State was ranked as high as 10 in the AP poll. So you take two teams capable of getting into the top 10 of the AP. You take 17 of the 22 com uh, Mount West Conference Championship appearances, and you combine them together. Listen, Hawaii, they, did, they tried their best in the Conference Championship. UNLV, they lost their only one they've ever been to. San Jose State, surprisingly, they won in 2020 with a shortened season. We'll talk about that. Hey, hey, hey listen, they, it counts. Here you go. It counts, okay? Wyoming went. They lost to San Diego State. Again, so there was five appearances, one in four in those games of the remaining team. So the narrative that this is easily the best G6 conference. Continuing on, the, the other day, just the other day, the Memphis AD gave the most hay. I said no for now, but if you guys want to send another invite, I'll listen. He ba he gave the most non-committal <laughs> no I've ever heard in com. He was like, "Yeah, it wasn't a good deal for now." Wink, wink, wink. wink. <laughs> what you got to remember here, this is the thing about that. They we're going to add four. They were going to get to ten members. Right. Utah State, they knew what was up. They saw the writing on the wall. They got in with it, so they signed the deal. So now there's only probably three slots that they're looking at. And of those three teams, listen, as much as South Florida hasn't exactly been as successful on the field as you would want them to be, let's just make sure that we're clear about this too. The American Conference Championship, there's been nine games. That means there's 18 appearances out there. Nine of those appearances are out of the league. Okay, right. so that's UCF, Houston, uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati, and won by SMU last year when they won the league. Mm -hmm. SMU, and now an ACC team, again, just work with us here. Of the remaining nine appearances, five would go to Memphis and Tulane. South Florida's never gone. Listen, we understand. But if you add those members, now the conversation, again, if you add the top of the Mountain West and two teams that are capable of being in the top 10 together, that's easily the best G6 team. If you add Tulane, Memphis, and South Florida, it's not even a G6, it's a different organism at that point. Mm. Then it's power two, you know, the two you know, uh, second lieutenants, the Pac-12, and then 10 miles of crap, and then maybe the Sun Belt? I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, Liberty's holding up their end of the bargain. We know your boys. So the fact of the matter is that that's where they're at right now is, again, conference realignment is never going to be done ever. I actually could talk about what I think is going to happen. Like, like what does 2070 look like for college football? It was going to be a crazy conversation. But right now, that's where the Pac-12 is at. They've had their seven members. They really don't need an answer until – June 30th, 2025, because they want to make sure they can avoid the conference realignment or the, the, the conference exit fees for the next year. They kick in after that next day. So things are fine. It's much more stable than the Mountain West. 
the Mountain West, UNLV, the greatest question in the world. Mm. What is going on at UNLV? First of all, that's a Matt, starting quarterback, backup running back, NIL payments over here. We're not even going to address that. They signed a deal. They, they signed a binding agreement to stay with New Mexico, Hawaii, San Jose State, Wyoming. And Wyoming fans, I love you guys. Okay, I actually feel like uh, Wyoming fans, good, good hearts. I appreciate you guys. Air Force, who, what are they going to do with that money? It doesn't go to NIL. You and I pay, our w federal withholding is what pays for all that stuff. Like, what are they going to? They're going to the, buy F-16s with it or something. I mean. So the problem is, <laughs> well, the, the problem is, is like, when you think about UNLV, they sign with the Mountain West. Part of the deal was if they get an invite, and this was literally in the deal, part of the deal was if they get an invite from the Big 12 or the ACC, they can leave. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. If the Big 12 or the ACC are going to add anybody else, where in the pecking order is UNLV? Maybe 13th, 14th? You have been, I, this man right here has been the most, UNLV is a fake fan base. It's, it's bot traffic. Nobody, if you walk through Las Vegas, nobody cares about the team. They play at an off-campus stadium that they have to tarp off the top row. They got $25 million that you and I both know that's not going to buy you a stadium. What are they going to do with the $30 million? They got a $30 million. It's 30 pieces of silver is what they got, okay? Mm -hmm. They have literally, they, this might be, I'm not trying to say that, I'm not trying to say that the Pac-12 is the SEC, and I'm not trying to say that UNLV is Georgia Tech. But this is this similar situation to Georgia Tech leaving the SEC in 1964. Mm. Because there's no guarantee you're ever going to come back, and one conference is headed for ascension, and the other conference is not, it's going to be in a lot less of a situation than the ascending conference. It's very clear about that. So my, my favorite theory is that the AD just had a really wild night on the Vegas Strip with the endowment fund, and then just couldn't pay the exit fee. That's, I think that's the going, going writ theory right now. <laughs> no, you see, the problem with that the problem with that thought <laughs> is that right there has a legitimate excuse. <laughs> if you're UNLV, like, and I, so I want to make sure that we're clear. But you, you try and do this with me. Let's, let's, do, let's do this collaboratively. Okay, let's steel man the case. Okay. We're not going to straw man this case. Oh, we're okay. UNLV right now. All we're right. going to steel man taking $30 million, saying no to the Pac-12. The good news is, is you have $30 million. Fantastic. You can buy an 8,000-seat stadium on campus. You can build a brand new You can update you know, Sam Boyd Stadium or whatever it is that you, with $25 million. That's cool. That is yours. You're now connected at the hip with New Mexico, Wyoming, Air Force, San Jose State, Hawaii, and uh, Nevada. Oh, yeah, the power of Nevada. <laughs> I, that's about it. You get a paycheck, and I don't know, because you know that they're going to have to add either New Mexico State, Texas State, UTEP, Sacramento State. Like, the problem is, is, What's the logic there? If, if the logic is the Pac-12 is going to fall apart, that might be a fair thing. Oh, the Pac-12, it's just going to fall apart. The Pac-12 has already came out and said, like, we're, we would rather add UConn. We're going to do this that way. We'll find an eighth member. We'll, we'll yeah. make sure that we're good. I don't know how to steel man not accepting the deal. He, I mean, this is just kind of spitballing a theory, but you know the – what football is not just something that they've ever really cared about. I know that recently they've been putting some money in and some, they've been trying to invest and do some different things. Hey, and you know this, and what percentage of that is Barry Odom and what percentage of that is them actually trying to be good? Because right. you and I both know that Barry Odom is looking at that 2026 schedule and he's got he's, – his, his most difficult away game is going to be at Nevada. Yeah. And he's trying to get a P5 job immediately. Oh, yeah, 100%. Continue, though. Well, again, yeah, so much of it is on the coach and the questions are how do they go from here. But if you're looking at, at UNLV – which, again, there's a lot of things going on for that program. So behind the scenes, I mean, you have your starting quarterback that's been successful for everything you've done this year, and he asked for a little more money, NIL, which, again, Vegas, $100,000 is, that's a good night in, on the Vegas Strip. Mm -hmm. You know, so, like, that is, they have, they have the money in their budget. They should have the money in their budget, and you can't pay him, and you lose him. There's a lot of weird things going on. But here's, here's my thought. You know the... Their pride, what's their pride? What's their athletic pride there? It's not football, it's basketball. That's what they're built on. That's yes. what they've had success. And recently, playing up against the Mountain West, they just haven't been cutting it. They have, they have and, and the best Mountain West teams have now left. San Diego State, Utah State, Boise State, you know, even Colorado State had a, had a decent year. Yep. You know, so like, like the, the good basketball teams have left. Now, if you know these looking around at a way that they can get back to the tourney, who are they playing basketball-wise left in that conference? 
New Mexico, who has some history but hasn't been great recently. That's it. San Jose State doesn't have a basketball program. They do have one of the worst floors in the, in the history of the NCAA, but they don't have a basketball program. Air Force Academy, I mean, I love the Air the Force Academy. The hardest place to recruit in college it's basketball is the Air Force. so tough. The hardest one. It's so tough. Air Force Academy, I mean, we go through the whole list here. I mean, none of the other teams do. So now you're looking, as UNLV, you're looking at that conference, and basketball's always been your pride and joy. You basically just bought your way into, or not bought, bought paid, got paid to be the automatic bid to the tourney every single year from the Mountain West. I don't know. That is just me theorizing on because I, 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 for me, I'm looking for answers because it makes zero sense. I didn't want UNLV to be part of the expansion of the Pac-12. I didn't want them to be, and now they're not, not because the Pac-12 didn't want them, because they didn't want to go. I can't wrap my head around that. So the great thing about that too that everybody needs to realize here is that. And this is the fact that I'm going to say this is absolutely bananas. Kentucky football makes more money than Kentucky basketball. Now that's sound, you're like, what? That absolutely <laughs> is 100% true. So of conference realignment, again, 80% of it is football. Right. There's like a 10 to 15% basketball, and then yeah. there's 5% whatever everything else is. So if are you? I mean, like I understand what you're saying. Where? Well, they could look for that automatic bid. All they got to do is beat Nevada and New Mexico, and they get to the off conference, or they get to the the tournament. You and I both know it's going to be a 15 seed at that point, maybe a 14 seed if it's conference. They'll be playing in Dayton. They, they will be playing, or they'll have a play-in game in Dayton or something yeah. like that. So I, I, I understand you're like, that is one aspect to look at that. That does seem to me, though, jumping over dollars to grab pennies, you know, yeah, just because, like, the conference payoffs for football, it get, they had the offer. The offer was on the table. They said, no, hey, you know what? If you can figure something out, that's fine. I will say this. Pac-12, a lot of people were talking about the Pac-12 with the realignment here. One thing that's really interesting here, I would not be surprised if UT San Antonio, of those four lists, because remember, there was at one point, there was the, the graphic of, it was the American, and it had those four programs on mm -hmm. the graphic. I was like, oh, that's because those were the ones that were rumored to leave. I wouldn't be surprised if UT San Antonio is removed from that graphic and remains Tulane, Memphis, and South Florida. Here's mm -hmm. what I mean. Did you know there's no direct flight from Memphis to San Antonio? I, I, I tried, and if you guys can find it, I, I will obey a culpa the whole situation. There's no direct flight. So flying from Memphis to Denver, direct flight, is shorter than flying from Memphis to San Antonio. Wow. So here's another thing. Salt Lake flies direct to Tampa, New Orleans, and Memphis. Hmm. So one of the things people have mentioned, oh, yeah, well, you know, the non-revenue sports, there's going to be a lot of expenses there. It's going to be so hard to integrate there. What I think will probably happen hmm. is there will be, if they get to 10, there will be five west and there will be five east. And the east will be Colorado and Utah State, who both fly direct to all three of those locations. Hmm. San Antonio, wow. ironically, doesn't fly direct to Memphis. This is a weird thing that you have to remember. that like, That's a way that you can help reduce those non-revenue sports. It's because people, people forget here. If UConn were to be added to the Pac-12, UConn's going to fly a chartered flight directly from uh, from Storrs, Connecticut, directly in to Boise, Idaho. They don't have to take a bunch of stops. It's one plane. They're going to be one person. But the Tuesday night volleyball games, the Wednesday night soccer, Thursday night, you know, uh, track. Those typically, that's what when you a lot of times when you go through an airport and you'll see a team, you're like, what the heck is this team doing here? <laughs> a lot of times that happens. So. There's little things like that that help you kind of integrate. Part of Kennesaw State, weirdly, Kennesaw State's addition into Conference USA was the fact you can fly into Atlanta. And mm. everybody flies into Atlanta. You're like, Kennesaw State makes a lot of sense. For There's a lot of things that go into this. Institutional you know, uh, direction, drive, TV in terms of what the people want to watch you. And then also like, you know, how would I say this here? Like logistics. Appalachian State's going to be hard. That's going to be a tough one to integrate with. You know, whereas like Rice, as much as we talk trash, Houston's a big airport. Right. That's the little things that you have to factor in, especially when you get to the lower, lower levels of college football. USC can fly there uh, in UCLA with the amount of money that they're getting. They can fly back and forth between Maryland and Rutgers and Indiana and Minnesota all they want to for all the non-revenue sports because when you get $80 million, it's going to work out. You get down to that level where the, the Pac-12 is at, and you've even remembered that they were like, yeah, the deal wasn't that great, but, you know, maybe, you know, maybe a little <laughs> bit. What are we talking about here? I suspect in the next couple of months, before June 30th, 2025, there will be an addition of those American teams. And like I said before, at that point, we're not talking P4, G6. We're talking P4, 
G5, and something in between. Mm -hmm. And the, the point is that here's, here's one of the big reasons. Why would you do this? What's going on here? Let's just make sure we're clear. Let's just say DEF CON 1, worst thing that can happen. What's the worst thing that can happen? Big 10, SEC, ACC, Big 12, all say, nope, here's the line, no, you guys are out. You still want to have the best league possible. Right. There's no part about that where it's not like get the best, because then it will be, you'll be the SEC of the G6. Right. You yeah. still have to do that the best that you can. I like these moves so far, and I know they're not done. All right. Dude, don't worry, dude. We're going to take, this will be an eight-hour long interview. Don't even worry about it. It's going to be eight hours long. Okay. Hey, we got the best studio space we've dude, ever used. I'm gonna, Might I'm as gonna, well I'm utilize gonna, it, you know? Three and a half hours. We're going to go get some sushi. We're going to come back. <laughs> We're going to make all of our content for the rest of the year. We're just going to break it up into chunks here. 100%. <laughs> all right. This is the real question that we're talking about. You kind of alluded to it there, but I want you to go into more of the specifics of this. Can, this is a yes or no question, but I want you to fill it in. Can Boise State return to the magic of the 50 and 3 era? And how do they do it? So, yes and no answer here. My answer is going to be yes and contingencies. Sure. <laughs> so, yes, I think they can get to it in spirit. If you look at Boise State teams from the past, gutting 15-3 was super impressive. Mm. But if you look at 2003 through 2004, they had three years there where they won uh, 12 games, 13 games, and I might be off of my number here, but another 12 or 13 games. Mm. And so that – Putting together consistent 11, 12 plus win seasons is something that Boise State did before Kellen Moore got there. I mean, Kellen Moore and Chris Peterson and the Fiesta Bowls, those took us to another level, but the foundation was rate was already laid by, you know, players like Ryan Dinwiddie, who came through and set everything up for Boise State even before. I mean, even Dirk Cutter and everything he did to lay the foundation for this program. And so I don't think you need Kellen Moore to get to 50 and 3. I think all you really need, especially with a school like Boise State, especially with a school like the brand and marketing power of Boise State. The people with the that Blue want to get rid of that, 100% no. No, nope, and they don't have a score of the athletic director, about? so okay. not going to happen. Continue, continue. But when you have a school like Boise State, when you have the brand that Boise State does, when you have the recruiting advantage and the history that Boise State does, all you really need is the right coach, and it doesn't have to be a Chris Peterson. I mean, I, I, I love Brian Harson, but he wasn't Chris Peterson, and he was still extremely successful. Did yep. he get us to Fiesta Bowls every year? No, and I know that was the standard then, but how many of us last three years would love to have had what Chris Peterson was putting on the table every year? I mean, really, the only time in Boy State's history going from – the end of Dirk Cutter's career all the way up through the present, the only time we've ever faltered is under Andy Avalos, and it's just because that was just one coaching hire that wasn't the right fit. And again, I'm not trying to put hate on Andy Avalos here or anything. I think he's an exceptional DC, and he's part of the brotherhood, but that just wasn't the right fit. But you and I talked about this. When we did our previews, and we do this every year, so make sure you guys, again, are tuning in. Um, but we, every year, we preview the entire schedule, and we go through. We t every single season, we've said this team can get to 10-plus wins. Yep. And they should have been able to get to 10-plus wins. Mm -hmm. And what happened? happened the moment that Andy Avalos was removed from the program and Spencer Danielson took over, Mountain West Championship, right away. We went from being clearly on track for one of the worst seasons since 1997 and, like, not even getting to bowl eligibility, and that was the discussion point, mm -hmm. to winning three in a row, including Mountain West Championship game. And then, without even having a quarterback, I mean, you're, you've got C.J. Tiller out there who has zero starting experience, almost no playing experience. We still almost beat UCLA, mm -hmm. who was a very, very good program, one of the best defenses, top ten defenses in the country. And we were, I mean, again, second half, not right adjustments, but whatever. We almost beat them with a team that was headed for the worst season since 1997 because this roster has always been good enough mm -hmm. to get to 10, 12-plus wins every single year. Now, there, you do need to have a couple of factors to put you over that edge, to get from just being a 10 or 11 win program to being a undefeated program, to maybe having a single loss in the season type program. There are things that you need in place, and I think Boise State has those right now. And it all starts, number one, with the athletic director. You look at those teams, those Boise State teams that from, you know, 2000 on, and even before that, you look at those Boise State teams, obviously they had – what I would like to say is an incredible athletic director there. Uh, <laughs> and, but this Boise State, that, that between, between end of 2011 and moving up until 2020, they went through a rotating phase of athletic directors, and you saw the athletic program, Boise State football and everything else, begin to plateau. I wouldn't say they truly declined, but they yeah. definitely were not on the same trajectory because you, it takes an athletic director like Jeremiah Dickey to truly advance your program. I don't think people really fully grasp how important it is to have someone that you can trust who is 
absolutely working day and night for this program behind the scenes because it's not just the football coaches and it's not just the players. If you don't have someone out there getting you the right schedule matchups, promoting you in the right way, making sure that funding is coming into your program in the right way, you're not going to have that on-field success. Jeremiah Dickey takes over 2022 to 2024, $71 million raised. $71 million raised. Steady ticket increases. We're now at 20,500 plus for this season, mm -hmm. but steady ticket increases every single year. When we, previously, Boise State was on a five year decline in ticket sales and uh, sales. And during a point when Boise State had some of the three worst years in, in the modern program history, and yet season ticket sales increased every year underneath him. Aggressive moves in scheduling. We've got you know, Notre Dame, we've got Oregon, we've got Washington, you know, those, some of those teams are still coming up. The move to the Pac-12, and again, there's a lot of hurdles and who knows what's going to happen, but he made the jump and did what's right for this university to put it in the right place. It, it takes a quality athletic director and, and then a community engager. You have to have somebody who is out there engaging with the fans at a personal level. Um, and I think Jeremiah Dickey does that better than anybody in Boise State's history. And so that, that's, that's the first stage. Next step underneath that, you've got to have good coaching. I think it starts at the top of the athletic director but then underneath that you have to have quality coaching and the person the elements that make a successful football coach especially at Boise State are are three elements I think personality innovation and being able to set the right culture personality Spencer Danielson can't be beat I mean how many times have you heard a player or an assistant coach say that they are gonna go kool-aid man for him through a brick wall I mean that is that they, he should get that just you know tattooed on his shoulders brick wall because they will go through that for him. Do you remember when he had the co the comment in the summer and the comment was, um, if you are coming here for NIL or I want to get my number, you are going to hate it here. <laughs> and he got roasted by all of college football. Hey, you NLV fans, <laughs> where you at? <laughs> but like you said, that culture like. People think that, oh, yeah, it's just all NIL. It's not all NIL. Yeah. Now, yes, Ashton Genty got a, probably a new car, a new apartment, and 300 Gs. But listen, he could have, could have gotten eight somewhere else. Yep. He chose to stay for what you're talking about. Yeah, the, pers the personality. You have to, especially in today's modern age, where the players have so much power and, and control I mean, with NIL and the transfer portal. Uh, when you have a new generation, I mean, Generation Z, they're, they're, they've they got a new take on how things work and they ask questions and they expect to get answers. And so it takes a coach with a personality who can speak to his players, who's not just going to be like, well, I told you to do it, so go do it. Someone that they can trust, that they know actually cares about them. Uh, the second element there is innovation. And, and it's kind of harder to tell with a defensive-minded coach who's not hands-on with the offense. Because you know, obviously, like with Chris Peterson, you could see the innovation and Boise State's offensive style with him. But I, that innovation, I believe, is there. And the way that, that, that Spencer Danielson has worked with the athletic department for these, these NIL programs to help make sure those are set up. I mean, a lot of that's Jeremiah Dickey as well. But I, I believe the innovation is there. I mean, that what he's doing in the recruiting-wise is, is definitely innovative. Um, so that one, maybe maybe not, but I, I believe it's a, key, it's a part that he has. But the third part here that definitely you have to have is the culture. And again, it's not just the personality, but what are you setting up? Are you setting this up as something that we are out there playing as a brotherhood together to go out and get a group goal? Or are we out there trying to go get, be, be individualistic about this? Are we trying to, to go out and just achieve the hardware? I mean, Spencer Danielson and Boise State in general, but Spencer Danielson definitely preaches that it's one game at a time, every opponent is equal, I and mean, we prepare for Portland State the same way that we prepare for Washington State, and we're out here working together to put our best effort on the field as a family together, and what we win at the end of the year, that will come. That's not our emphasis. Our emphasis is being a program that, that fights together and does the right things and, and does it the right way. You know, We are going to go out there, and we're not just going to win. We're going to win with sportsmanship. We're going to make sure that our character is at a high level, that we are doing the right things off the field and on the field, and not every program does that, and Spencer Nielsen does. And so we have the athletic director. We have the coaching. And then obviously underneath them, you have the players. You can't win anything without the players. So Boise State, they have the players. I mean, Ashton Genty, you've got five-star quarterbacks who are ready in the wings and waiting when they're developed and ready. Malachi Nelson, you know, you've got – everybody said – it annoys me so much when you see on Twitter or in the, in the national media space – when they go, oh yeah, Boise State's just Ash and Jendi. They just and they and they talk about it like we lucked into him somehow. Like one day we were, you know, rubbing 
um, our, 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 uh, de our vases, you know, and, and the genie popped out and we got Ash and Genty. You know, and that's not how <laughs> Boise State got Ash and Genty because Boise State is Boise State. Boise State was able to not just recruit, but keep Ash and Genty because of what this program is. And guess what? I'm not going to say that Saturday Games is Ash and Genty, but that's a 17 year old out there who is running like a starting athlete at almost any group of five and a lot of power four programs. And Dylan Riley. And Dylan Riley. And Jean Bray Dubar. Dubar. And, yeah, sorry, not Jean Bray Dubar. Freezy and, and, Dubar. And, and, oh, yeah. so only, yeah, okay. It's so like, yeah. yes. So, yeah, it yeah. makes sense. I mean, so Boise State, they. Ha they are they have these top players because they recruit those top players because they come for the culture they come for the blue and they come for what Boise State has been able to do historically and what they're going to do going forward and so you have I mean again yeah Dylan Riley you know Chris Marshall again has been dealing with some injuries but he came here you know Cam Camper we've seen everything that he's done he came here and then Boise State even outside of the stars they have the kind of guys that are going to elevate a program the OKGs you know the Tubners the Crows the James Ferguson Reynolds the Maddox Madsons maybe they aren't Maybe other people aren't looking at them, but Boise State is, and we are developing in a way that nobody else does. Yeah. And so that is that's been going on this whole time. But I think it's going on at an even higher level with a coach like Spencer Jansen back at the reins. And then the final two elements: national spotlight. Have you heard about the Heisman campaign? I know I'm not wearing my Heisman shirt today because I'm in the esports facility. JFR, you gotta show. You, you, you go, hey. Yeah, that's if if, uh, if Spencer Jansen has taught us anything, it's when you come to the esports facility, you gotta wear the JFR Absolutely. shirt. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. that's in the in 100%. the rules. In fact, you might you might get docked for wearing that shirt instead. But, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so. You know, the he Heisman campaign, what other group of five program has a Heisman campaign going on for it? None. Um, you know, CFP bringing a new focus into the group of five. Everyone wants to pretend like the CFP and NIL and transfer portals killed the group of five. But if anything, all three of those things have actually made it stronger. They actually made it stronger. They made it stronger, yeah. and Boise State is at the forefront of all of those. And then the final element is, like I said, we talked about this. This team has always been good enough to do it. They just haven't had the right combination of everything above. And so, yeah, do I think that they're going to go and do 50-3? I don't know if that's ever going to be achieved again in college football because it hasn't been achieved anywhere else in college football. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that Kellen Moore is 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 the goat because he's he did that with with everything else that was around him as well. That was so some great rosters, but that was unique. But are we going to see multiple undefeated seasons, multiple 12 and one, 12 and two type seasons going forward? We're back, baby. We're going to see it, and We're I back, believe that baby. it's coming. I love that. Awesome. All right, here we go. Question for Jake here. And really, honestly, we're talking about the future and what does it hold for Boise State and can they get back to that? Uh, we're going to continue with that discussion of the future here with my next question for him. Uh, what is the next realignment domino to fall? Okay, so we're in a weird spot right here because the next big realignment domino to fall, tech, if, I, if I'm in, a, in Las Vegas and I'm betting money, it's going to be some of the American teams coming over. You know these endowment money? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, again, I, listen, if you're a UNLV fan, Listen, I, I, I throw a little bit of shade there because I was like, listen, you, you ha I throw shade because now it's more complicated, but I might not throw shade if we go back, we get, we being the Pac-12, get Memphis and South Florida and, and, and Tulane, and then you guys are, you have your automatic bid for this, uh, the NCAA tournament. Good for you, you know, <laughs> good work there. But I think the next part in realignment is going to be that because there's nothing really that's stopping that as much as the America wants to sign the agreements. Matt West already did. Good luck with that. I think that that's the next point of realignment. But I think that more importantly, we'll, we'll talk about the next thing. But then where is this all actually going? That's the better conversation. That's a much funner conversation yeah. to have. What I think is going to happen is as much as I think they're going to do what everybody who's in a pressure situation does, they're going to do everything they can other than what they should do first. And then they're going to do what they should do. The ACC. Let's just make sure that we're clear about the ACC. They currently have, I think it was something like 40, 30 to 40 percent of the views of ACC football. Florida State, Clemson. Now I know this year hasn't exactly been great for Florida State. <laughs> we're not gonna go there. But people still watch. They're not winning, but people are still watching. They're eventually gonna be like, and they're gonna do the same thing they've been doing for a while. A couple years ago, they were like, hey. We're basically most of this TV deal. Can we get most of this TV deal money? At that time, the Pac-12 was doing even distribution. Washington State and USC got the same money. Mm. Again, why do you think USC looked to leave? Now you're looking at the same situation with the uh, ACC, where the Florida State and Clemson are like, hey, guys, we're doing most of the heavy lifting here. Maybe not today, or maybe not this <laughs> year. We're doing most of the heavy lifting here. Can we get more money? 
they say, no, we're suing, we're getting out of this league. And actually, apparently now they're talking about, oh yeah, what, remember that two years ago, you guys proposed that to us? Let's talk about that again. <laughs> Let me ask you, do the, does the ACC talk about giving one team more money if they didn't have to? Mm -hmm. No. They, it looks like the, the, the rumor is, and again, this is starting into to nerd territory, I can't touch this. The rumor is <laughs> that in court, it's not going well for the ACC. So they're trying to find a way. They have one of the greatest calamities. People say it's one person who destroyed the Pac-12. It's like 30 people. It's like 30 really, really dumb people who made 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 huge mistakes. It's not just one person. Hopefully, of that long chain of people making those decisions in the ACC, one of those 30, 40, 50, 60 people can avoid this situation. I'm betting that they're going to try. Now, it might be you have to give Florida State and Clemson 40% of the deal, which mm -hmm. is going to be like Miami's going to be, okay, I don't really like that. Wake Forest is going to be furious. But let me ask you a question. What leverage does Wake Forest have? Uh, they have they have Bachmeyer, so They have Bachmeyer <laughs> running run the, the, the slow mesh. Don't get me started on the slow mesh. I got some NCAA college, or EA college football up here. But let's just make sure they're clear. One good question, and here's a good question. Let's just say that the NFL – this is, this is weird, and it's not going to happen, but we're going to play a game. Mm -hmm. So the NFL came for college football. Mm. The NFL came for the top of college football. Okay? The, the, they wanted the SEC. They're going to pick the best teams. Who are they picking? You're probably going to pick Alabama. You're probably going to pick Georgia. I bet LSU. Florida, I know it's not going right. You probably pick them. Texas A&M. Probably Texas A&M, probably Tennessee. Yeah. Are you picking South Carolina? No. Are you picking Kentucky? Not unless your basketball's coming Maybe. along. Maybe. Yeah. Are you picking Missouri? I like Eli Drinkowitz. Love what you're doing. Mm. Uh, Mississippi guy. State is a no. Yeah. You know, Vanderbilt is a no. My question to you is, if we saw a Pac-12 style kind of pillaging, what would happen to the middle and bottom of the SEC, and what would happen to the middle and the bottom of the Big Ten? Because there is a middle and a bottom of the Big Ten. Top, you're going to put USC, you're going to put Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. You probably put Nebraska from like a value perspective. Uh, maybe not on the field, trust me. Not. I've, I've watched all the Nebraska <laughs> games. Love you guys. Please. Okay, my, for my friend's sake. But then after that, you're like, okay, like where does Minnesota fit into college football? Where does Northwestern? Where does Illinois? Where does Maryland? Where does Rutgers? Rutgers, basically, their addition to the Big Ten has been – all of the Ohio State alum who live in New York can now go to a game. That's basically what they've been. Mm -hmm. So if we're in a situation where in the future the ACC is looking around and they're like, hey, we either need an unequal revenue distribution or we're going to get plucked. Now, can we keep our, our, our A rate eight the same way that the Big 12 had? Can we stick together and pluck teams? It's a, Who knows? The better question is, is that right now the Pac-12 actually had something that's going to show up in the Big 12 and the SEC, the Big 10 and the SEC. They just signed it. 50% of the revenue from a CFP appearance goes to the team that goes. Before in the Mountain West, it was evenly distributed. Mm. Now you are rewarded for what you kill. Ohio State's looking at Indiana and they're like, hey, we go to the CFP every year. You guys don't. We're not doing e equal revenue distribution. That conversation is going to happen. And then the things will probably settle for a little bit here. But then I'm probably thinking 10, 20, 30 years from now. Ohio State, and again, these universities aren't going to be like, you know what? We're going we're gonna to get unequal e revenue distribution for CFP appearances, and then we're going to coast until heat death of the universe. <laughs> no. Eventually what's going to happen is that the, the big limiting factor in conference realignment is, and people think this is weird, it's how many games you can play. Hmm. Because if you could play 40 games, you could have conferences of 70 people. There would already be a super conference. Right. So you can't play that many games. So the problem with conference realignment as of late is that people have been adding teams. It was 12. Now it's 14. Now it's 16. The Big Ten's at 18. Yeah. They're talking about if they get Florida State and Clemson, that'll be at 20. The problem with that is that now that's 20 slices. So in that instance, what you do is you either do unequal revenue distribution, which could last for a little bit, People think we're headed for a power two. We're headed for an EPL, your English Premier League style, top, middle, and bottom. I Here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that. Ohio State and Michigan love that. 
USC, Penn, uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia, and Alabama love that. Minnesota, Missouri, South Carolina, Kentucky, Texas A&M, Florida, um, who else, who else? Uh, let's go, Indiana, Maryland, Rutgers, they hate that yep. because now it's what do you do on the field? Yep. That's eventually what's – first of all, football is going to separate from the rest of the sports. It's going to. We act like it's not going to. It's going to. Right now, UW plays conference games for women's volleyball in New York. What are we doing here? <laughs> football is going to separate. As you saw recently that the that Big Ten, the SEC, were meeting to kind yeah. of discuss maybe an alternative model to the NCAA. First of all, people have been calling for that forever. But what I think we're heading into is that the top teams want to play each other more often. When you add – USC and UCLA and Washington and Oregon to the Big Ten, you still sometimes have to get your USC at Indiana, mm -hmm. your Oregon at Maryland, your Minnesota at UCLA. And you're like, the TV partners are like, ugh. <laughs> at the end of the day, especially if we go DTC, direct to consumer, mm. do people watch you? Do people not watch you? That's going to be what it is. So I think that in the future, what's going to happen right now, the next domino realignment, Something's gonna happen with the American. The that the AD for Memphis said as much. I think that the ACC will figure something out if they. Here's the thing, if they get pillaged, if they don't, kind of doesn't really matter. It doesn't stop the momentum of those top level teams are always gonna want more and more and more and more of a slice of the pie, or they'll want a bigger pie and a bigger slice of it. Whatever it is, that's not gonna stop, and the current system still has inefficiencies. That's where we're heading in the future. We're gonna get to some sort of, maybe it might, might not be promotion or relegation, but there will be some sort of EPL style system that college football will implement. If we move to promotion and relegation, I want royalty fees. Cause I was like literally the first person to suggest that on my channel. So if that happens, I want, ro I want royalty fees. And people fees. think, people think, <laughs> people think that, people think that, oh yeah, well the top teams wouldn't want that. The top teams would love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ohio State. If Ohio State was playing conference games against USC, Georgia, Miami, we you we watched. All the people that say that wouldn't be popular all watched Michigan and USC last week. Oh yeah. Five million people watched that game. I was one of them. The narrative that I wouldn't watch. Get out of here. Okay. <laughs> that absolutely is what's gonna happen. These TV markets, these TV partners who have been putting pressure and pressure and pressure. Eventually, when things kind of settle, they're gonna be like. You know, we can make this even more efficient. Joel Klatt said this a while back, too. Joel Klatt's like, we talked about conference expansion, conference realignment. We're going to talk about people dropping from conferences. Because remember, the Mountain West, ironically, was formed from the whack, from the top teams being like, screw this, let's form our own league. Do you think that the SEC has that much of loyalty? Or do you think Mich uh, hmm. Alabama, Georgia, LSU, and all those teams are like, Listen, we this is a lot of history. It's so cool. We love Vanderbilt. We got what to play them every year. What if we triple the amount of money we get? Right. And first thing you guys know, non-for-profit doesn't mean you're not trying to make as much money as you want to. Let's make sure that we're clear about that. Not-for-profit doesn't mean everything's just great. It just means you make all the money and then you spend all the money. That's what not-for-profit <laughs> means. So, like I said, American, something that's going to happen. Then the ACC, 25 years from now, I would be surprised if the SEC exists in a football context. All right, my man, back to you. So, I actually, I don't even need to break my notes. I already know this one right here. So, we've been talking a lot. One of the only G5 teams that has a legitimate, in September, Heisman campaign for one of its players. I mean, in September. We're not talking like, oh, yeah, well, at the end of the season, this guy was really good. Blah, blah, blah. We're talking like, it was very clear by, like, week, by September 8th, it was like, okay, he's going to be a problem, like a national problem. The addition, the falling off of Ollie Gord with whatever is going on there has <laughs> helped, but let's just make sure that we're clear. He's on a different level, Ashton Genty. Him going to New York, Kellen Moore went to New York. Mm -hmm. All right, that's cool. What does an Ashton Genty Heisman win? Heisman first place. What does that look like? I think a lot of it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to Boise State fans, we're saying he deserves it. 
no matter what, really, this year. I mean, he, if he keeps up the pace, of even if he just drops 150 yards a game, combined with what he's done already, he deserves it. If you start talking about the national media outside the Boise State circles, now you get to different questions and different what does it take. Uh, I mean, some player, some people like you know RG3, they're out there saying Ash Genty, number one Heisman campaign. He's Ash, RG3 though isn't part of the media anymore. You know, he's not, he's no longer out there for ESPN, and and there's there's a reason for that because he's not a lockstep kind of guy, and so the lockstep media likes their lockstep partners, and a lot of those lockstep partners come from the Power Four, and so there is bias out there that's going to influence Who people that. People have been cutting the cord more and more on every single day, but you're right, right. it's still right now that there's still power in those entities. So right. Keep going. And so, you know, the question then becomes is what does it take to win over the voters enough? And I think you start, you, you start talking like replay terminology here. I mean, like you have to have clear and indisputable video evidence that Ashton Genty is the best running back in the nation. Because, again, he's also not a quarterback. He's also mm -hmm. a running back. And the Heisman Trophy has become largely accepted as somewhat of a quarterback award at mm -hmm. this point. Um, but Ashton Genty is in a unique situation with Boise State because – the reason that the quarterback usually wins the award is because in most offenses, the quarterback is the most important player on the team. Even if you have just an incredible running back, the quarterback is still running the majority of that offense and the running back is assisting. In Boise State's offense, because of everything going on with the quarterback position over the fall and everything like that, and obviously Taylor Green leaving, Ashton Genty is the core of this offense. And so so it's really like Ashton Genty's running the offense, and then the other pieces are assisting and, and aiding him. And so Ashton Genty's in a very good spot to have a chance to go. Probably the best chance of any group of five player and maybe – of any recent running back to actually go and win this award. But what is it going to take? I'd say if we were just talking podium, if we're just talking top three at that position, you know, top three, top four, 1,700 plus rushing yards, 10 or more wins, Mountain West Championship appearance. So I think that really, because I think all of those things are going to happen, no matter what happens this season, he'll be in New York. Because I think all of those things are going to happen. I think we're going to have 10 plus wins. I think we'll be in the Mountain West Championship. And I think he'll have 1,700 plus or something rushing yards. I mean, he already has almost 600. He's played two and a half games. And he has mm -hmm. a lot of games where he's not going to sit in the second half yeah. the rest of the season. But what is it going to take for him to win it? Outside factors included, having to beat, break through that bias. I think we're talking at around 2,000 yards rushing, mm -hmm. somewhere in the 18.5 to 2,000 plus range. CFP spot. I agree. That's a big one. CFP yep. spot. Yep. You have to keep yourself in the national light. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, even at the power four level, it is somewhat rare to have a team that's at least not in, at least not even in contention. Like they usually have to be at least be in contention for the CFP. Like they don't have to win the national championship, but they have to be in contention. Like Jaden Daniels winning it with LSU, that is not the norm. That's a bit of a rarity there yeah. to have a, a team that's three losses, right, like completely out of the CFP contention, not even like top three in their conference, actually going out and winning the Heisman. So even just in general, I think he needs to make CFP, but especially as a group of five running back. I think if he has 2,000 plus yards rushing, wins the Mountain West, gets to the CFP, he will win the Heisman. I think it's 100% lock at that point. Now, if he gets like 2,000 plus yards all like rushing or 2,500 yards all purpose, 11 wins, and a Mountain West Championship win, but out of sight of the CFP, now I think it's in the air. But like the, the way that the national media is talking about Ashton Genty right now, they have not talked about a group of five player ever like that. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk about Kellen Moore like this, who got to the podium. They didn't talk about Ian Johnson, who I think was seventh in the voting like this. Boise State's had Heisman campaigns before, but nothing like what we are seeing with Ashton Genty. He's a different kind of athlete. He's going to be a first-round pick. He's probably going to be the first running back off the board, and he is going to lead this team to a CFP. And if all of those things happen with the national limelight that's on Boise State, on Ashton Genty. Boise State's 2-1, and one, folks. They have a win against an FCS program, and they barely beat Georgia Southern, who has not proved yet that they're a great team out of the Sun Belt, and they mm -hmm. lost their Power 4 game. And they're top 25. And Washington State, who we're going to play here tomorrow, or depending on when this video came out, they might have already played, but I mean, like when we're shooting this playing tomorrow, they're 4 0, have two power four wins, and they're at 26. Mm -hmm. Boise State's number 25 because of Ashton Genty right now. Mm -hmm. That's why they got put into the top 25 by the national media. And I think that speaks volumes for where Boise State is being looked at in the national contention. It's if Ashton Genty can keep this up and the team can continue to push him up into that playoff spot, 
I think he wins the Heisman. All right. And, I, and you know, I'm thinking off the top of my head. I'm trying to think from a national landscape what could happen there that could mess that up for him. I won't say mess that up because that means it's, it's a guarantee. Because obviously if he wins the Heisman, first right. of all, it's a running back. It hasn't happened since, I think, Reggie Bush. And then beyond that, I think the, the, the last non-quarterback was Devontae Smith with, with Alabama. But I'm thinking, like, Cam Ward's off to a good start. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, 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 Carson Beck for Georgia is the Georgia quarterback. He's going to get a lot of love. Um, I think the Shadur Sanders, Travis Hunter. Tra <laughs> Travis Hunter, I, I would say this. I love Ashton Tennessee. I think the Travis Hunter is, man, I don't know. I, I, okay, those two are two of the best players in college football. But that team's going to go maybe six and six, mm -hmm. maybe seven and five. So I, I don't think that's going to happen there. I mean, I, I think you also have a point with Colorado's, Colorado, not Colorado State, Colorado, Colorado State wishes. Um, I think you also have a point with Colorado is that people outside of Colorado, like a good portion of them just absolutely hate that team. They hate that team. They hate Deion Sanders. They hate the, I mean, the, like, they're, like right. again, I can explain voter. why. I can, I can <laughs> again, explain, I can well, I think why. that's another, I think that's another video. I think we all know yeah. it in general. But. I, I'm going to give, I'm going to give a, I'm going to go real, I'm going to explain. I'm going to, because <laughs> part of me, I want to make sure that we're clear and we can, we can give this to the Colorado fans. Okay. Let's make sure we're clear about something. Okay. Colorado fans. All right. I actually loved Deion Sanders as a hire. There's videos of me. I love him as a hire. I think he's fantastic. That team. The year before he got there, 2022, was one of the worst teams in yeah. college football. By Joel, Joel Klatt was on this. He was like, they averaged losing games by 29 points. <laughs> Their only win was against a 4-8 and eight team at home. It took them overtime to, to beat. I believe it was the Cal Bears at that point. So the reason why you guys are see receiving so much animus is because you were a positive story when you guys beat TCU, and then you wouldn't shut up, okay? <laughs> listen, listen. I hope, I hope you got. I actually want. If there's so much hate towards Colorado, I actually want them to turn around. Like turn around is like seven to five. I want them to go like seven to five. Like humbling enough, but like it's Dion's got coach Prime's got on the right point. But <laughs> you, they were the noisiest four and eight team in college football history. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, when, whether the hate is justified or not, the main point on that is the hate is out there. And if, Certainly if, you're, out there. if you're having to overcome bias, you're talking about Ashton Gentry, well, Colorado's having to overcome bias as well. They don't have that working towards them. And Cam Ward, he's a great point, yeah. but he's also an ACC quarterback. If this was Cam Ward at Alabama, Cam Ward at ten Texas A&M, like SEC behind them, playing the toughest schedule in college football, then I then I would say, okay, with everything that Cam Ward's doing and having that backing, he can beat Ashton Gentry. Yeah. But he's playing in ACC, which looks absolutely terrible this year. All of their tough, Super top teams, top heavy. all of their top teams, even like their top heavy teams, like have proved they're terrible this yeah, season. Yeah, so honestly, you know? the, the, the like, ACC championship game might be Miami versus Boston College. That actually, could, it's, a, it's a very serious happen. conversation. Could legitimately yeah. happen. And so, again, ACC quarterback, Cam Ward's doing great things, but he's not doing like the best things we've ever seen out of a quarterback mm -hmm. ever. You know, like Ash and Genty is legitimately doing some of the best things, like he's like there are some great names out there running back wise that he's not going to eclipse, but he's being mentioned in the same conversation as them. Like Cam Ward, like you're not going out there and you're comparing him like in the same breath on every tape as all of these first round NFL draft picks mm -hmm. necessarily, um, or like all these historic greats from the past. So again, Ash and Jandy, I think he's in a really good spot. I said this before the season started that if there was ever a year to win it, this is the year because there just aren't that many top-level candidates out there this season. Like, this is the year where there's a vacuum. Ashton Gendy is what he is. He is popping at the right time in a place where all eyes are on him and they're not being pushed out to the side. And so, again, I think that if we get to the CFP and we do it on the back of Ashton Gendy and the storyline that is, because everybody loves a good Boise State team. Like, even the haters love a good Boise mm -hmm. State team, the story that brings with that. The media loves a good Boise State team. And they can look and they can go, Ashton Gendy did this. For me, I, I think that you'd be hard, especially if we're talking about like a 12 and one, 13 and one yeah. Boise State team. I think it's really, really hard. And to, to take that, that point that you said there, with the fact that, and you even said mentioned that last year when Jaden Daniels won it, it was it was kind of like ah, he's the best player, the best conference, but they're not really the best team. We're kind of in a yeah. weird spot. Think about this. I want to say 2015, 2016. We knew September 1st, Alabama and Clemson were going to play each other. We yeah. knew September 1st last year. Conference championship week. If I would have told you that Oregon won the national championship, they finished eighth in the uh, in the final CFP poll before uh, they uh, not the final CFP poll, but the one when they got placed in their bowl games. 
They finished eighth. If I would have told you they won the national championship, we wouldn't be surprised. The transfer portal, a lot of people thought it was just the top teams are going to take people. It has leveled the playing field in college football a lot more than people think. Like I said, 2015, 2016, you knew who the championship was in August. Last year, December 1, you had no idea. Last year, a 9-3 and three LSU team, I guess he's the best player. He's great. This year, like you said, Carson Beck, maybe Jalen Milrow, Kim, what? Yeah. This is the year to win it for Ashton Jindy. Yeah. All right, final question, and uh, hopefully we haven't overstayed our welcome here, and we can actually go and uh, and, and do something really exciting Get here. Get your cot over the, there. We're going to yeah. stay here. <laughs> but final question here, and again, hopefully I'm showing you footage right now of us playing the College Football 25 video game, because hopefully we still have time to jump on there and do it. If we didn't, well, we ran out of time, that's why. Um, but, and, and if we do, it's probably footage of Jake just absolutely demolishing me in the game. But um, final question here on the video, and this has been a great discussion, but we would be a remiss if in the home of Boise State Esports. Absolutely. If we did not talk about College Football 25 real quick here at the end, and just ask you, who is not just the channel that this video is airing on, Jake Posey Master Football, he also has the MF Film Room, which if you have not watched it, is an incredible channel that is just College 25. It's just incredible stuff, just breaks it all down. Make sure you guys check it out. Uh, but Jake, for you, real briefly here at the end, EA College Football 25, worth the hype? If, even if it is or if it's not, what would you change where they need to improve and what still has you hooked? Because you're still playing it, you're still making videos, so you must still love it. Is it worth the hype? What would you change? What still has you hooked? Without a doubt, it's worth the hype. Look, let's just make sure we're clear about this. This is the best football game. Not in terms of, you know, uh, oh, it's a college football. This is the best football game since Madden 2004. Madden 2004, you've got Michael Vick on the cover. I'm 98% sure it's Michael Vick on the cover. You've got the ability to make playmaker, all those cool features. I think what they've done is, last, it was rumored to come out in 2023. And then a couple of months before, they're like, you know, it's getting pushed to 2024. And everybody's hands were up in the air. We were like, we've been waiting for 10 years, now it's gonna be 11 years. They have honed in the gameplay on this game so well. It is without a doubt, for certain. Is it the greatest football game of all time? Maybe not. It's certainly the best one in the last decade. That's not even a question. It is the best simulator of football I've ever played in my entire life. A simulator, truly like you feel like these things. If you ever want to know why, if you ever watch Iowa football and wonder why <laughs> they can't throw the ball down the field, I want you to put the game on, take Iowa's offense, play against Ohio State, turn on a Heisman difficulty, and you try and throw the ball down the field. <laughs> you will experience so much chaos in this game, but that's how it truly is. A lot of people act like, oh my gosh, in the NFL right now, all these passing stats are down. I think there's a discrepancy but somewhere between the tackles and the defensive linemen, and you will feel that in this game. You will feel every aspect, my quarterback, my offensive line, the protection, the crowd, everything has an impact on this game. They've done a really, really good job. Your better point, though, is the fact that, is it perfect? Of course not. It's got a lot of things. What they did is a really good job of, they did two things they aced. On-field gameplay and atmosphere. The crowd, the this, the that. You've got the, the celebrations, the, the mascots, the, you know, the, the, the things here, the things there. They've done a really good job with that. What they could do a better job of, though, is there's certain logistical things they could do a better job of. Unfortunately, if you ever play in like a dynasty with somebody, you feel kind of isolated. I am with you, you're my, my friend, you're in the same league as me. I have to actively go and find you in certain areas. It's mm -hmm. hard to kind of find. It, it it's, it's, removes the immersion aspect of it. You don't really feel like you're connected. You kind of feel like you're your own team. Same with the recruits. There's little things like that they could do that make it a little bit more holistic because it is a national sport. As much as people think, oh yeah, well, you know, the power two and nobody else cares. There's a ton of viewers in those ACC, Big 12, and those Pac-12 and Mountain West, well, the top of the Mountain West. Games, there's tons and tons of viewership. The narrative that there's not a demand for this is just not a real narrative out there. So I think what they need to do is understand and try and find a way to make the game a better immersion when you're with other players. Make it feel like it's a true aspect of this game is actually, uh, oh God, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he's the lead de developer at Bethesda. He had basically come out and said his favorite game, he made Starfield, one of the biggest games ever. He came out and he said, my favorite game of all time is NCAA College Football 2014. <laughs> Everyone was like, you? You nerd? And it was like, it's one of my favorite games. <laughs> it's because a college football game is different than an NFL game. Hmm. The RPG, a role-playing game, you are, your, your, 
how do I say this? I'm going to put this in a nerd territory. So if this is over your heads, just like and subscribe to the video. First of all, do all that. <laughs> but you think about your character. Let's just say it's just like a, a regular game. You think about your armor. You think about your, your weaponry. You think about your, your characteristics. That's your team. That's your recruit. That's your offensive line. That's your playbook. That's your this, that. It's a true RPG experience, being the head coach of that team, recruiting. There's turnover. Nothing's going to last forever. It's, it truly feels like it's yours. I am right now six years in to a dynasty with four of my, with three of my friends. We have no CFP appearances. It's Heisman difficulty, it's hard. No CFP appearances, and I'm off to a five and zero start. So we're off to a good start right now. <laughs> but it is truly one of those things that you can replay it and replay it and replay it and replay it. It's one of the best games, certainly in the last decade for football. And so far it's obviously, my, I, I like it more than all the other football games combined. Well, there you have it, everybody. This was, just an incredible experience. This just is awesome. Being here this in awesome. this studio element, being here with Jake, I mean, this is awesome. I, we've done a couple of in-person videos, but I, I think the last one we did was like on your couch, right, I think? It was so on my couch. <laughs> and the, the more embarrassing thing is, so if you watch a couple of my videos, he even said I, 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 had, this, the, I had the Vanderbilt Stadium status because <laughs> – I was I just got done moving in, so I haven't made as many videos as I've wanted to. Right. But I literally behind me, I, I picked up my drill. I'm like, I'm not even done hanging up all my stuff. <laughs> so the fact that we get to do this here is incredible. I want to thank everybody for this studio. This is incredible. Boy State Esports, you guys are awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'll be shouting them out every opportunity I can get. Let me know if you guys are doing something. I'd love to be there. I'd love to interview you guys. But yeah, dude, I've this has been a blast. This has been incredible. Thank you, Boy State Esports, for letting us invade your space for this. Very long, but I had a blast. I think engaging, Absolutely. a fun conversation. Thanks, everybody, for watching all the way to the end. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, whichever channel you ended up hitting this up. If you, if you watch it online, I'm going to put the links to all of the eSports stuff. I'm going to put their their channel, their YouTube, their, Insta their, their Twitter, all of that here. And then I'll also put links over to Jake's stuff. Make sure you Do go it. watch. Do it. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here all the way through the end. Jake, this has been awesome. Any final pot parting shots? I, I need you to give me what you've always given me before. Send us off, my friend. Thanks, everybody, for watching this video with us today. Thanks for watching all the way through. Make sure you like and subscribe to both of these our channels. And as always, go Big Blue!